Greetings. My name is Bruce Smith. I'm an investigative journalist, and I'm the author of D.B. Cooper and the FBI. It's a case study of America's only unsolved skyjacking. It's a great mystery. There's a lot unknown about the D.B. Cooper case. We don't know his identity. Nothing in the case has ever been found except for about $6,000 worth of torn up pieces of his ransom money eight years later after the skyjacking. Never found the parachutes, never found the bomb. And it seems as if everything in the case is up for discussion and, and is filled with mystery. D.B. Cooper presumably jumped out the back of his 727. No one saw him go, but it was presumed that that's how he, he got away, by walking down the staircase, jumping out, pulling his ripcord, parachuting to the ground, and somehow getting away. And we'll look at all those aspects, but let's start with the parachutes. When D.B. Cooper skyjacked his airplane, part of his ransom demands was, I want $200,000 in cash, and I want four parachutes. Give me them. I'll let the, pa the passengers go. Give them to me in SeaTac Airport, and I'll let the passengers go. And then when I'm finished, when you take me where I want to go, then I'll give you your plane back. And I need the crew to stay with the plane and fly me. And so that was the deal. And, and Northwest Orient thought it was a good deal because, you know, they're just going to fly this guy around a little bit and they're going to get their plane back and the passengers are going to be safe and <laughs> that plane will be flying passengers the next day and making money for Northwest Orient. The FBI, they weren't too happy with that. The FBI, they want to get their guy. Um, and so there was an uneven relationship between the FBI and Northwest Orient. But in terms of the parachutes, here's what we know. The back parachutes, he asked for two front and two back parachutes. So he asked for a total of four, but he wanted two different kinds of parachutes. He wanted front parachutes, which most people, most skydivers would know was a reserve chute, a smaller reserve chute that kind of sits over your torso, maybe your belly. Sometimes it's called a belly pack. But the big chutes, the main chutes, would be on your back. And Cooper called them back chutes. Now, some people say, you know, when a guy asks for front chutes and back chutes, that means he's not a skydiver, really. He's, he's a wuffo, as they call it in skydiving. He's a wannabe. At best, he's a beginner. And the FBI kind of played that up. Yeah, Cooper really didn't know what he was doing. He was just smart enough to get himself into trouble, and he got himself dead. Why we can't find the body? Eh, we don't know. But he probably died. And he probably died because he didn't know what he was doing with the parachutes. So that's why we're talking about the parachutes. How valid is that analysis by the FBI? Was Cooper a woofo? Did he use a bad parachute? And the current understanding of the parachutes used and analysis of what kind of capacities they had refutes that. What we do know is that the back chutes were the first to arrive. So ransom money was coming in from Seafirst Bank in Seattle. It was already uh, on tap, 
the FBI, to their credit, had stockpiled in their field offices around the country. They had anticipated an extortion crime like D.B. Cooper, and they had begun stockpiling money because they didn't want to be hung up in some kind of hostage negotiation. It's like, yeah, yeah, we'll give you your money, but, you know, the banks aren't going to open up until Monday morning, so it's going to take us a couple days to get that money to you. They didn't want any of that, so the money was stashed. I mean, it was just a question of sending a cop over to the bank, getting a squad together, protect the money, parceling it out, putting it in the bag, and getting it back down to the airport. That happened pretty quickly, but what happened even faster were the backpack, the back shoots, arrived. We now know Jeffrey Gray, in 2011, wrote a blockbuster book about D.B. Culp- Cooper called Skyjack. And he was the first one to identify the owner of the back shoots as a guy by the name of Norman Hayden. Up until then, everybody thought that the owner of the back shoots was a fellow by the name of Earl Cossey, who was a skydiving champion, uh, a parachute rigger, and worked at Issaquah Sky Sports in Issaquah, Washington, which is about 30 miles east of, um, of SeaTac Airport, or east, east of Seattle. And as it turns out, Issaquah Sky Sports was where the FBI eventually got the front chutes, the reserve chutes. And they were last, the last to arrive. So the back chutes from Norman Hayden arrived first via taxi cab. Then the money came in from Seafirst Bank, delivered by a squad of uh, homicide detectives, as it turns out, from the Seattle PD. And then the back shoots came in from Sky Sports, courtesy of the Washington State Patrol, who sent a cruiser out there, and they come in with lights and sirens. Everything, it took about two hours to put this all together. Um, And initially, finding these parachutes was not the easiest thing in the world. The first call went to uh, the military base, the Air Force base, uh, south of Tacoma called McCord Airfield. And uh, they were preparing parachutes. They figured this guy wants parachutes, they're going to put them together. Um, And when word came back to Cooper, you know, we're going to get those parachutes from McCord, they'll be here any minute. He said, no, 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 I I don't want any military shoots. Shoots. I want civilian shoots. I was like, oh, okay. So the next call went out to a civilian supply house uh, called Pacific Aviation. And the person making that phone call was a fellow uh, from Northwest Orient. He was in charge of uh, operations at Northwest Orient uh, at SeaTac Airport in Seattle. And he called Pacific Aviation and talked to a fellow by the name of Barry Halston. Halstead says, all I've got here on the shelf are what we call seat chutes. They're not back chutes. These are seat chutes that a pilot would sit on, um, like in a skydiving, like in an uh, acrobatic uh, application, like a, a pilot of an acrobatic plane uh, might sit on his seat, on his parachute that is placed on top of the seat, and the seat is designed to receive some kind of funny, you know, uh, tushy kind of parachute kind of thing. Um, what D.B. Cooper wa- wanted was the more standard, what you see in the movies, John Wayne, the Green Berets jumping out of the airplane, skydiving, this kind of thing. And um, so Barry Halstead told Northwest Orient, says, I got a customer just down the street. His name is Norman, and he's got two back shoots because he's an acrobatic pilot, and he decided to go with the back shoots. So George Harrison called Norman, Norman Hayden, 
at work just down the street in, in Kent, just a few miles away from the airport, and said, you know, we got a skyjacking here. We got a uh, life and death situation. Uh, we'd like to rent your, your back parachutes. And Norman thought it was a prank phone call. He wasn't listening to the radio. He was a machinist and was busy at work on the machines and the lathes. They're all running along. And ironically, he was making parts for Boeing. And uh, one of the parts he was making uh, were some of the gears that allow the, the aft stairs to lower down on 727s. And Norman makes the joke now. He says, D.B. Cooper jumped out of his airplane wearing my parachute. Uh, walking down staircases that I helped build for Boeing. So um, that's the story from Norman, and he, put, he, he was so busy, he, he didn't take them himself to SeaTac Airport. He put them in a, in a taxi cab, and the documentation from the Washington State Historical Museum confirms that uh, George Harrison, in his interviews and his paperwork uh, from that day, confirm that the that he had uh, had a conversation with Norman Hayden, made arrangements, made a deal with Norman to get two parachutes and was um, going to rent them um, for the duration, and that they were coming in by taxi cab. They came to the Northwest Orient uh, freight desk at SeaTac Airport and picked up and then were transferred to Northwest Orient personnel and eventually driven out to the airport the airplane once Cooper and Flight 305 actually landed at SeaTac several hours later. So um, that, that story holds water. But nobody knew that story in the public until Jeffrey Gray wrote it in 2011. Forty years after the fact. And that's like what happened that everybody else had another story? What was that other story and how did it get going? And that story in the investigatory field is called the common understanding. The common understanding is not based on any particular documentation. The common understanding that was held in the public's mind that journalists wrote about, books were written about, other authors talk about at length, and were publicly discussed by FBI agents themselves, despite their own documentation in the files that refute it completely, was that Earl Cossey provided the back shoots. And Earl Cossey told the FBI and the public that the shoots that he provided were very different than the ones that Norman Hayden provided. Norman told me, I talked to him in 2011, right after I found out that he was the owner, right after I read Jeffrey Gray's book, I called, I looked at Norman Hayden up in the phone book. He was there. He's still working in his machine shop. I went down to his machine shop in Renton, Washington. And... He showed me the what's known as the not used parachute. So Norman provided two back chutes. One presumably D.B. Cooper used to get away. And it's out there somewhere. Wherever D.B. Cooper landed, whatever he did with his parachute, that is still unknown. And nobody knows where. But the chute that Cooper did not use... The FBI got it on the plane. It was lying there right in the seats when the plane landed to refuel in Reno, Nevada at about 11 o'clock at night, so three hours after the skyjacking took started. And 10 years later, Norman had successfully sued the FBI to get his parachute back. So Norman has this very uneven relationship with the FBI. They're at each other's throats for reasons that are hard to fathom. And, um, but Norman had the parachute, the, un, the not used parachute. It's a civilian chute. It's called a, it, now parachutes have two 
components. The first component is the container that the canopy goes inside. And the container is what goes on your back. And it's got the straps and the rip cord and the leggings and the straps and ties everything to you. Okay? That's that's the external part, and, and, and most people describe the parachute by the name of the container. This container was known as a, a pioneer, so everybody calls this the pioneer parachute. When in actuality, it's only the pack is a, is a pioneer, and the, and the straps. What was inside gets a little bit more hard to discern and inside is the nitty-gritty. Norman's parachute that I inspected and he showed me is a Steinfall 26 foot diameter white non-rip nylon conical parachute. And that's in the FBI documentation that one of the parachutes that went on board the plane but was not used was a Pioneer Steinfall 26-foot conical parachute. And that, in fact, is what Norman showed me. Now, Norman told me that he gave Northwest Orient two identical back parachutes, meaning Based on Norman's testimony, that D.B. Cooper would have received two Pioneer parachutes with Steinfall 26-foot diameter conical white non-rip nylon parachute canopies inside. So either one would have been the same. That's not what Earl Kasi said that he provided to Northwest Orient. Earl Kasi says that he provided the pioneer with the Steinthal, but he also provided a parachute, a military parachute called an NB-8. Now an NB-8 is the container and it stands for Navy backpack 28 foot conical parachute. N stands for the Navy. So this was designed for Navy pilots to be used inside Navy aircraft. Now military pilots, particularly fighter pilots and such, don't wear reserve shoes because it gets in the way of the controls and everything that they have to do in the, in the cockpit. So the only parachute that a military pilot would use is a specially designed emergency rig just for pilots. And that's what an NB-8 is. An NB-8 is designed for a military pilot to use when his plane shot down. Or another disaster happens and he's got to go. He's got to bail. So it's going to be a very basic, very simple, no fooling around, it always works, you pull this cord, boom, you're good to go, kind of thing. Because it's the only shoot you got. You don't have a do-over. If that doesn't work, it's not going to be a, a pleasant outcome. Now Norman said that he provided two identical shoots. Now his thinking for having two identical shoots was, was this, and this is what he told me. He says, why would I have a mix and match kind of situation? If I'm up in the plane, in my, in my plane, and I've got a passenger with me, which is why I need the second shoot, and FAA regulations require that I have a second shoot for a passenger, and that the parachute is always there. The passenger may not be here, be there, but the parachute for the passenger will always be there. He said, if, we've, if we're going down, if there's a problem with the plane, and I've got to bail out, 
my passenger is going to bail out and I want him to be able to see exactly what I'm doing with my parachute so that it's good. This is all happening split seconds. You know, you don't have a whole lot of time to talk about this. This is where the ripcord is. This is what you're going to do. As soon as the canopy comes up, we're going to be free. We're going to jump out of the plane. This is what you pull and then this is what you do. He said, I don't want any confusion. Like, oh, my parachute's over here, but yours is over there. No, 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 no. Norman said, no, no, sweet. I had identical parachutes because it was a question of safety. Now, ironically, Earl Cossey told me that this NB-8 that he gave to Northwest Orient, he had because he was using it for his own purpose, his own personal recreational purposes, and he had greatly modified it. So he had taken a parachute that was designed to be easy peasy to use in an emergency and he mucked it all up. He changed the, the position of the ripcord, he put it in a pouch, he hid it. He said, I did that because I didn't want it to snag on something on a jump plane or I didn't want someone fooling around with me when we're flying up the elevation before we're going to skydive, yada, yada, yada. I don't want anything to go wrong. It's only for me. I know how to use it. There's not going to be any problems. But for D.B. Cooper, he doesn't know any of that. So he's going to put on a parachute that he might think he knows how to use. But I've modified it so much, he ain't going to be able to use it. So D.B. Cooper was a no-pull. His quote, Earl Cossey's quote to me was, D.B. Cooper was a no-pull. He augured into the ground somewhere because of the modifications I made to the parachute. It was too difficult for a woofo to use. Well, why did, the, why did Earl Cossey say that? How did he get involved? Well, Earl Cossey was in, contacted by the FBI right after the skyjacking occurred back in 1971. He was a local skydiving hero. He was a champion. He was a professional. He worked in the field. The FBI needed to know what kind of guy are we looking for. Apparently, the FBI... Parts, members of, of the FBI were really impressed with D.B. Cooper early on. You know, this guy, he jumps out of the back of an airplane at night in the middle of the rain. Holy shamoly, this guy is Superman! So they wanted to check out the professional skydivers. They wanted to go to competitions. They wanted to send agents like tailing these guys all over North America, the United States, Canada. Cassie says, no, 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 no. He comes in. He's a paid consultant. He says, you don't got to do that. He says, he wasn't necessarily a pro. Could have been, but he didn't have to be. To survive this jump. If he had five or six lessons with me or a guy like me, I could have taught him everything he needed to know about jumping at night, in the rain, landing in the woods, and things like that. So don't you don't have to go looking for the professional guys. Put your time and money somewhere else. That's in the records. It's like, okay, cool. Well, the FBI kept working with their Okasi over time. And I don't know how it happened, but it must have happened early on. My own speculation is that an agent didn't know about Norman Hayden. And Earl Cossey was talking so authoritatively about parachutes and D.B. Cooper that the agent, some agent early on, must have assumed that the parachutes came from Cossie, and some agent might have said, like, over lunch in the front of a crowd or something like that, oh, yeah, you know, when you, when you gave Cooper those parachutes, he, you know, and, and, and one was the military thing, and, you know, and right after that, maybe Cossie, through his own excitement about being a public figure, wanting to be in on the action, feeling important, maybe he socially or psychologically was on the spot, he said, yeah, the parachutes are mine, and began describing them. And the first parachute he described was not an NB-8. It was, it was an NB-6. And that's what went in the records as the, as the first documentation of what D.B. Cooper actually used. And FBI agents still talk about that, the NB-6. 
which was a Navy backpack, 26 footer, a little bit smaller. Then Cassie over time changed it. He says it was an NB6, but it had a 28 foot parachute inside. So I mixed and matched. I took the parachute out of an NB8 and I put it in the smaller container, the NB6. And so you have this go back and forth. And there's on public records, FBI agents saying, yeah, I talked to Kasi about this stuffing thing that he did. Why did he do that? And, and Kasi just blew me off. And it, all of it is canard because Norman Hayden provided the parachutes. And they were two identical 26-foot canopies. So you have this deceit, this deception. And at some point, whether this was inadvertent or was deliberate, I don't know. But I can tell you what I do know. The FBI bought in to the Earl Cossey story. They bought in to the notion of what Earl Cossey was saying about D.B. Cooper's selection of a parachute and his skills and what the whole thing means about his possibility of survival. The FBI, for years, said Cooper picked the military chute. First they said it was an MB6, and then they said, no, it was an MB8. And they don't explain why they switch. And that was a bad shoot. He should have picked the fancy schmancy pioneer with the Steinfall 26-foot canopy inside. Why was it a better shoot? It was an easier ride. It was more padding. It was a luxury. Cassie described it, he said it was the Cadillac, whereas the NB8 was the VW Bug. Well, a VW Bug can get you where you want to go just as well as a Cadillac. It's just a question of style. But Kasi and the FBI used it as rationale to evaluate D.B. Cooper as inexperienced. Didn't know how to pick a good shoot. Picked a bad shoot, an inferior shoot. Now, that thinking has been strongly refuted by other skydivers. In the D.B. Cooper Symposium that was held in Portland in 2011, a very knowledgeable skydiver by the name of Mark Metzler castigated Earl Cossey and indirectly challenged the FBI's analysis that was based on Cossey's analysis. And it really isn't a question of an NB8, NB6, Steinfall, Pioneer, and thing like that. The real nitty-gritty is what is the chute? What is the actual canopy? What's going to be floating in the breeze? How good a parachute? Now, Mark Metzler accepted Cassie's scenario that it was an NB8. And he said, that's not an inferior parachute. Because as a military parachute, it probably had a military canopy inside. And the prevailing, predominant canopies used by the military are parachute canopies called C-9s. And C-9s are, as Mark described it, the pit bull of parachutes. Very rugged. They're designed for jet emergency parachutes departures. When you got to leave a jet airplane and you're flying at five or six, seven hundred, eight thousand miles an hour, you're going to be going pretty zippy. Now all that wind and that speed is going to dissipate very, very quickly. Air resistance and things, and depending on when you pull the ripcord, you know, you're going to slow down tremendously. But still, to give yourself an extra margin of safety, the C-9 will pull safely up to 200 miles an hour, whereas a civilian shoot maxes out at around 150. And Mark said the difference between 150 miles an hour and 200 miles an hour is there's 
more pressure on the fabric and the stitching and the threads and the seams and all of that. So at 200 miles an hour, a civilian chute may rip apart. Whereas the military C9 will hold together and you'll be able to get to the ground safely. That was Mark's initial presentation. Over time, Mark has begun to take a closer look at the whole controversy over Norman Hayden and Steinfalls. And currently, Mark is saying, whether it was a pioneer, whether it was Cassie's parachute and an MB-8, or it was Norman Hayden's parachute and a Steinthal, Steinthal still made parachutes according to military specifications. So it could have been the parachutes inside Norman's Pioneer container could have been a C9 or a comparable or a Steinthal built to C9 specifications. To prove that, we'd have to take a look at Norman's parachute, the not used parachute. Unfortunately, Norman has refused all requests to do that. He's told me, he says, I don't want any part of this whole mudslinging controversy that's going on between you and Elkasi. When I've challenged Earl Kasi, when you talked, when I talked to Earl Kasi, he was very happy to talk with me. But there are a number of red flags in terms of his veracity. First thing is, he never wanted to talk to me in person. Everything was over the phone. Second thing, when I asked him about his story on the transfer of the parachutes from that he had the back chutes and he's sending them off to D.B. Cooper in Northwest Orient. His story was that he sent them first to Boeing Field, which was the wrong airport. Boeing Field is, is basically right next to where Norman works in uh, Kent. Kent and Renton and SeaTac. It's all that industrial area south of, uh, south of Seattle. And so the parachutes went to the wrong airport and then had to be transferred uh, through a private driver up to SeaTac Airport. And I asked, I asked Cassie, I said, how come you sent him to the wrong airport? And at that point, he just exploded and cursed me out and he slammed, the, slammed his phone down. And that was it. He never talked to me again. Shortly afterwards, about a year, 18 months later, he was murdered. And that enters into this discussion because in 2011, Everybody believed Earl Kasi. After 2011, when Jeffrey Gray started talking about Norman Hayden, and I started writing about Norman Hayden, starting to go see the parachutes and talk to Norman, and, and a lot of conversation back and forth, and Metzler started presenting his stuff down in Portland, Earl Kasi's reputation started to go downhill. It was going in the toilet fast. Two years later, he's dead, murdered. He was found murdered, lying in his garage one night in April. The autopsy revealed he'd been lying on the floor of his garage for at least two days. The question is, what happened? A lot of people thought somebody, some puppet master who was controlling the D.B. Cooper investigation, controlling the cover-up. It's taking care of a loose end. The murder investigation was handled by the Kings County Sheriff's Office, and I talked to the public information officer for the King County Sheriff's Office. Her name is Sergeant Cindy uh, West. And she's very interested in the D.B. Cooper case, but she was very professional with me over the phone. And she says, I've received a lot of phone calls from a lot of people asking if this murder has anything to do with the D.B. Cooper case. And she said, our investigators have not found anything that links it to the, to the case. And we've called the FBI in to assist us in this particular issue. And they're telling us that there is no connection between D.B. Cooper and the death of Earl Kasi. 
But after the death of Earl Cossey, his reputation was scrubbed tremendously. Leading the charge was Jeffrey Gregg, who really <laughs> kind of spilled the beans. And I suspect he did it inadvertently by telling, every, by telling the world about Norman Hayden. But that really was the beginning of the unraveling of Earl Cossey's reputation and his stature and position in the D.B. Cooper case. And within a year or two, Cossey's role in D.B. Cooper shifted from the guy who provided the parachutes and knew about the exact knew exactly what kind of parachute D.B. Cooper actually used and was calling D.B. Cooper a wuffo and that he died and he, he augured him to the ground, he didn't make it, all that was thrown out the window. And all that D.B. all that Earl Cossey was described, characterized, was that he was the guy who was the rigor. And that is in fact true. Earl Cossey was the guy who folded and packed all the parachutes that went aboard Flight 305. He was the standard rigor at Issaquah Sky Sports, and that's where the front chutes came from. So he packed them. And I have the packing card from Norman Hayden. Norman P Hayden used Earl Cossey to pack his chutes. And I have the packing card from Norman verifying that. Oddly, Norman says that he never met Earl Cossey. But he sure knows all about him. And that's why Norman isn't talking to me anymore. But fortunately, Norman is talking to others. He's talking... Uh, extensively to the Washington State Historical Museum, who did a major exhibit on D.B. Cooper in 2013. And for that exhibit, the not used parachute, the Pioneer with the Steinfall inside it, was on display for the general public. And it's my understanding that Norman sold the parachute to the Washington State Historical Museum, so it is now currently in their collection. So we can go check, take a look there. Uh, and verify what kind of chute is inside. Is it a C-9? Is it a, uh, a parachute that has military jet capacities? Or is it more of a civilian, slower speed kind of thing? There's one more element to this case that Mark Metzler brought up at the conference. See, regardless of whatever parachute D.B. Cooper may have used, his knowledge of how to set the plane up for a parachute exit with the not going over 10,000 feet, not flying faster than 200 miles an hour, having the landing gear, the wheels down and locked, and the wing flap set at 15 degrees, at that time was all top secret level information. And the question is, how did D.B. Cooper know how to do that to a 727? D.B. Cooper knew more about the 727 in that regard than the pilots did. The pilots, and no, or anybody in flight operations at Northwest Dorian. And it, and it fell to the CIA and Boeing to tell Northwest Dorian, oh yeah, you can fly a 727 with the aft stairs down for a prolonged period of time because we're doing that all the time over here in Vietnam. It's like, oh, see, that's all top secret kind of stuff. So Cooper had access to top secret information. He could have been a commando, special ops, CIA, or he happened to be in a bar at the right time when two guys are talking about stuff they shouldn't be talking about in a bar, where he had a family member, who knows what. But if he had access to that kind of information, he may have also had access to other information from covert ops who were testing 727s to see what the best way to jump out of a 727 was. And what they developed was what's called a squidding technique. 
Whereas you didn't jump out of the plane. You got yourself down the staircase or to the opening uh, of the plane. You pulled your ripcord when you were still secured to the plane. If it's a bad chute and the parachute doesn't open, you're still on the plane. <laughs> but if it does open, the parachute canopy is going to squid out. It's going to whiffle and waffle out in the wind. And it's when it inflates, it's going to pull you off the staircase or pull you out of the opening of the airplane. And you'll and you will lower and you will have a safe. Your 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 parachute will open right away, fully inflate, and you'll be good to go. So Metzler was saying, if Cooper knew all that he obviously knew about the 727, maybe he knew stuff that wasn't so obvious to the rest of us because no one observed him. Maybe he knew about the top secret testing that was going on, the experimentation that was going on in Southeast Asia about how to deploy out of a 727 in the most safe and reliable manner. So when you add this all up, here's my takeaway. Cooper probably made it out of the plane. Probably made it to the ground. The FBI's documentation is in conflict with each other. To me, it's clear that the supervision, the management of the case, of at least the paperwork, was a mess. It's like no one was in charge. The documentation that I'm talking about is reprinted. Um, it has, has, the files have been made accessible to us through a variety of ways. It turns out Jeffrey Gray, apparently, stole them from the FBI in his research for his book up leading up to 2011. And once that was known, then I stole them from Jeffrey Gray because he stored them in an um, online cache that got penetrated by other D.B. Cooper investigators, in particular a guy who calls himself online, a snowman. The guy's real name is identity, I don't know. But snowman told me gave me the information, gave me the password to get into that case. I got in, I read it. I read what the, the FBI was reading, was writing about D.B. Cooper and the parachutes and what Jeffrey Gray was basing his book upon. And a lot of other people have read them. And now Jeffrey Gray has made those records uh, publicly available. And I've never heard anything from the FBI about illegalities or anything like that. So... Uh, it's my understanding that these records are legit, and uh, that's the story. This is an addendum to the parachute uh, chapter. Um, when I read the documents that I had gotten from Jeffrey Gray, that were attributed to Norman. When I read them to Norman Hayden, he said, no, 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 that, that, that's garbage. That, all, all that information is wrong. Plus, I never talked to the FBI. They, they didn't interview me. So it seems that the FBI's documentation and what I was reading and what is now available is a summary report of field notes and so apparently in the transfer of information from perhaps multiple agents in the field, interviewing guys, writing things down, when it all got put together, it was a mishmash. But Norman's name was featured as the, as the person that all this information is coming from. But it's not. And now we know when we look at it all, we can see that the summary report has bits and pieces, and it's a mishmash of uh, Earl Cassie said this, and a little bit from Norman, we're going to slap Norman's name on it, but it's, it's, it's a mess. 
And the question is, how does this happen? Now, it could be the very nature of a large bureaucracy conducting law enforcement investigations. This may just be the way it happens. That this is this is just another day in the office, and there's mess ups, crazy, or this is intentional. Somebody who wanted to control the narrative, control the FBI's public image, control what or influence what the public believed about D.B. Cooper, and they didn't want the FBI to appear like they were saying, yeah, you know, D.B. Cooper was a pretty smart guy. You know, he beat us. You know, he beat the man. And support that cultural phenomena where people were celebrating D.B. Cooper. FBI wanted him to be a criminal, a lousy, you know, rotten criminal is what, what Ralph Himmelsbach did. Nor Jack agent down in Portland was saying. So this may have been purposely all mixed together with somebody saying, you know, if anybody comes snooping around and starts reading all this documentation, they're going to be more confused, you know, afterwards than they ever were before they started. If that was the intention, I don't know. But that is definitely the impact. And such as it is. The other piece that I want to talk about before we wrap things up are the the front shoots, the reserve shoots. How do they pl play a role in this? Now, we know for sure that one of the front shoots was used by Cooper while he was on the plane. He opened it up, took it out of its bag, and started cutting up the shroud lines, the, the, the rope from the parachute to the harness, because he needed it to tie together his money bag. And Tina Mucklow, that's the last thing she saw before she went up into the cockpit, where she saw D.B. Cooper already had a parachute on and was cinching this money bag, making a rope handle and wrapping it around the bag and somehow attaching it or securing it to himself. Now, interestingly enough, the citizen sleuths have informed me that... Uh, the, the, the Citizen Sleuths, we'll talk about that more in other chapters, but the Citizen Sleuths was, was an organization of private investigators uh, in the D.B. Cooper world that were recruited by a special agent at the Seattle office by the name of Larry Carr around 2008, 2009, 2010, somewhere around there, to come in and take a look at things and bring a fresh pair of eyes that were free and uh, knowledgeable and take a look at the evidence and read some of the files and yada, 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 and provide some uh, authoritative uh, analysis. Excellent move on Larry Carr's part. Uh, really out-of-the-box thinking on his part, really. Um, what the citizen sleuths told me is that they found two reports, two field reports, FBI field reports, on the shroud lines. One report said that two shrouds were cut and each line was about 15 feet, so that gave Cooper about 30 feet to use. Another report said three shroud lines were cut, so that meant Cooper had about 35 feet to wrap things up. But the citizen sleuths told me that when they went to look at the actual parachute where the lines were cut, because the FBI still has that in the evidence locker, five lines, five lines were cut. That means Cooper had 80 feet worth of rope. He could have tied a lot of things together. It says two things. One is, FBI record keeping again is messed up. Two, what did Cooper do with all that rope? Which kind of suggests that maybe all the stuff that was not on the plane 
got tied into some bundle. And so they could find it. He could find it or his extraction team, his getaway guys could find it out in the woods and he pushed it all out. And maybe he used the line to kind of like as a, like a tail on a kite. He, he had, he attached all the stuff that wasn't on the plane for whatever reason that he just didn't throw it out the door, helter skelter. He wanted to hold on to it so he could bring it away from the crime scene. And that would involve the second reserve shoot. It was also the briefcase and the money bag. And somewhere there's a little tiny bag, maybe burlap, maybe paper sack or something like that. A little bit bigger than a lunch sack, smaller than a grocery sack. Somewhere in between there. Only It was only spotted at the end of the skyjacking as people are getting off the airplane and and there's not a lot of information on it. But whatever was in there, I don't know, maybe Cooper had it inside his coat. Who, who knows what, how it got on the plane. But people saw Cooper in possession of it as the skyjacking was wrapping up and people are leaving. Uh, the airplane in, in SeaTac Airport. Now, because the second reserve chute was not found on the plane and has never been found since, the question is, how did Cooper use it? Did he just toss it? Why would he? Why would he hold on to it? He ditches the Pioneer chute. He cuts up another reserve chute. Was he leaving fingerprints on it or something? Yeah, he's leaving fingerprints on the other stuff, so why worry about this chute? But he, maybe he did. The FBI strongly intimates, and a lot of skydivers and sleuths, D.B. Cooper sleuths, who enjoy holding on to the concept that D.B. Cooper died in the jump, grab on to this piece of evidence that Cooper must have used the reserve chute as some kind of safety parachute. Now, there was no hardware to attach the reserve chutes to the rear, to the main chutes, even though Cooper asked for them. They weren't provided. Chutes came in, but not the hardware to connect it all up. And most skydivers that I've talked to said there's no way that Cooper would have tied, used parachute cord to tie a reserve chute to himself or to the frame of the back chutes because the shock, if he needed that reserve chute, the shock of it opening it would pull those knots on that rope apart because uh, parachute cord is very stiff, very rugged, and it's hard to twist and turn and make a good knot out of and things like that. Most people say, I wouldn't trust it. That's why they developed all those metal D-clips and D-rings and all that stuff for attaching and stuff. So, most people that I've talked to don't think the reserve chute was used as a reserve chute. But the FBI intimates that it was and they say, see, that guy used a reserve chute that couldn't be attached, and they add another proviso. They say, we now know that that reserve chute was a bad chute. It was a dummy. It had an X on it. Now, that's part of the common understanding, that this second reserve chute had an X sewn into it or drawn into it or something like that. But it begs the question. There's no documentation on it. There's no pictures. And it begs the question, why would a bad shoot knowingly get on Flight 305? Why would Issaqa Sky Sports give Washington State Patrol a bad parachute? Why would a state trooper carry a bad shoot all the way to SeaTac? Why would George Harrison and everybody down at the Northwest Orion Freight Desk accept a bad parachute? And then four, why would they put it on a plane? Because at that time, since that there was two front and two back, the thinking was, Cooper's going to take a hostage with him. He's going to suit up Tina Mucklow, and even though she's wearing high heels and a skirt, he's going to push her out the airplane and tell her, hey, honey, this is how you pull it. When we're going down, this is what you pull. 
That was the primary thinking for people to say, you know, Cooper's going to jump and he's going to take somebody with him. So why would you put a crew member's life into danger with a bad shoot? Knowingly do that. So it begs the question, if this secondary shoot was some kind of dummy shoot that supposedly was used to, as a training tool to show brand new wuffos how to fold the parachute and uh, it's kind of convoluted and it doesn't hold water in my judgment so I think any analysis of the reserve shoot using of, of any analysis of Cooper's knowledge and capacities as a skydiver, using the reserve chute as proof or evidence of his stupidity, of his foolishness, doesn't hold water to me. It does to other people. I acknowledge that. But I don't see it. I don't see it. Now, last thing, the death of Earl Kazi. He was murdered. Apparently, he was hit in the head with some kind of large metal object. Cops won't tell me what kind. A lot of people say a hammer. Some people say a big pipe wrench, maybe a tire iron, something along those lines, something that's in a garage that's really going to crack a skull. And that's how, that, that's how Earl Kazi died. Who would kill him and why? Here's one possibility. When you take all this information, all this mishigas, all this confusion, all of these erroneous and conflicting pieces of information and documentation, here's a scenario that kind of ties things together a little bit. Suppose the FBI went to D.B. Cooper, I mean, went to Earl Cossey and said, look, we're having a problem with the public image of D.B. Cooper. Everybody thinks he's a big hero. Nah, we, we can't have that. He's got to be a criminal. We got to put out a message that lets the American public know D.B. Cooper was a bad guy and we're going to get him. So, Earl, tell us more about the details of these parachutes. Let's take the angle that, can, can you give us any facts? Can you give us any rationales of the kinds of parachutes he used? And he really was a beginner. He really didn't know what he was doing and things like that. So maybe, maybe, and this is pure speculation on my part, maybe there was a partnership between somebody in the FBI who was a, who was controlling the narrative of the D.B. Cooper story. A partnership between that person and Earl Kasi. And so there was this scheme developed that negated what Earl Kasi said initially. Remember, Earl Kasi told his family, well, oh, yeah, Cooper could have made it. He told the FBI initially, oh, yeah, a couple lessons Cooper could have made. It wasn't that big a deal. All the other skydivers that I've talked to, including Earl Cossey's friends and his co-champions in skydiving competitions, say, yeah, we all knew he made it. Anybody could make it that knew what he was, you know, that, that had the basic chops and, you know, sufficient testosterone levels. So Cossey found a way to reverse that. And if he did it at the behest of somebody inside the FBI to serve FBI purposes, would that be sufficient grounds to make Kasi a loose end, a liability 
once all of his pronouncements about parachutes and auguring into the ground and being a no pull and being a wuffo and all this, all of that was being refuted and Earl Cossey's reputation was going downhill. And maybe somebody said, you know, loose lips sink ships. And we can't take a chance on this guy. That's one possibility. Of course, there's plenty of others. Drug deal, gambling debts, an angry girlfriend. Who knows, okay? But that is a possibility. And it's worthy of consideration, I feel. Particularly in light of everything else that's going on. So, that's my story. That's my view of D.B. Cooper and his parachutes and then the death of Earl Cossey. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being with me, listening. And I'll see you next time.